Hello, my name is Seth Gale Weirich. I'm a senior mechanical engineer and sustainable design specialist with Bressler Group, a research-driven product innovation lab. I'm also a master's student in biomimicry at ASU and a member of the fourth biomimicry professional cohort through Biomimicry 3.8. The design case study in this video was originally part of my BPro application, but you'll be happy to know that I've edited out the personal stuff to help keep it brief. Let's start with the premise that whoever is watching this video is already pretty confident in the value of biomimicry. I won't spend time telling you what it is or describe how powerful of a change agent it can be. I also don't think it's a stretch to say that those of us with a passion for biomimicry believe that it has the potential to help preserve the world as we know it. The critical question, however, is one of adoption. How do we convince the designers and engineers that fill our world with stuff to use biomimicry to reimagine the way that they create? I come from the world of product development, and every colleague that I talk to about biomimicry has a similar response. That sounds great for research, they'll say, or sure if you're Patagonia or Interface, but how do we fit that into an already constrained development project? Personally, I believe strongly in the ethos of biomimicry. It was, after all, what got me interested in the first place. But spreading an ethos is slow. The desire for innovation, however, is universal in industry. And if we can demonstrate a process that delivers results, more and more people will start to listen. Once nature is valuable to them, not just as a material resource, then a desire to protect and restore it will follow. I chose an example for this exercise that I was familiar with from the mid-2000s. This particular problem was well known in industry as major battery manufacturers began to roll out what they hoped would be the next big thing in power for portable electronics. The technology is called Zinc Air and is still around in the form of hearing aid batteries and other niche applications. However, it never took off in the mainstream for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the technical issue that I will explore here. My hope is that by reimagining a well-known industry failure through the lens of biomimicry, I might be able to further the case for biomimetic innovation. First, a bit of background. In a typical battery, you have two primary materials, one associated with each pole. These materials react and are consumed as the battery is depleted. A zinc air battery, however, is a type of oxygen fuel cell, meaning that the battery itself only has to package a single material, zinc, and the oxygen for the reaction is pulled from the air. As a result, the battery is significantly smaller, lighter, and more efficient. However, this advantage comes with a new challenge. As long as the cell is exposed to the air, it's discharging, regardless of whether the device is being used or not. So to be very useful, the battery needs to be sealed from air when the device is off. It was assumed by engineers at the time that this would be a straightforward task, since there are literally hundreds of types of electromechanical valves that are well known. However, what they failed to appreciate was that even the smallest of these typical valves would take up enough space so as to negate the size benefit of the smaller battery. So what could have happened if this problem had been looked at through the lens of biomimicry? Of course, within the time frame of this application, I can't prove that it would have resulted in a workable design. However, zinc air came and went with no solution to this problem from anyone. Illustrating that a biomimetic approach can generate viable concepts alone proves value. And for this problem in particular, I think there's great potential. Because although we didn't make the leap at the time, all aerobic organisms breathe in one way or another. And essentially that's what this battery does and we just needed help controlling it. Since biology is well outside my wheelhouse, BPro Karen Allen was kind enough to spend an hour brainstorming with me. Now we do a lot of brainstorming at Bressler Group, and we've tried many different methods over the years. But looking at the problem of air management from the viewpoint of biology was a spectacular way to broaden the solution space. Brainstorms are always limited by the experience and expertise of the participants, and thinking through this problem with someone from a completely different field was truly eye-opening. Humans seemed like as good a place to start as any. The valves that first come to mind are heart valves, which are essentially one-way check valves. We'd never considered check valves before because you need a pressure difference for them to work, and it didn't seem that we had one. But now I wonder. Given that the oxygen is consumed by the reaction in the battery, it would make sense that a small pressure gradient would develop. If this were the case, an ultra-low cracking pressure check valve may be able to open only during an active load on the battery. Now the typical check valve that is most like a heart valve, engineers would call it duckbill, but it would never open at a low enough pressure. However, a simple elastomeric flap valve could probably be tuned to open and close at the appropriate pressure. This flap valve would be more akin to the epiglottis keeping food out of your lungs rather than a heart valve. And this got us thinking more about flap valves 
and how they could be actuated by something other than pressure. The epiglottis itself is driven by a number of muscles, including the tongue. These do have a mechanical analog in shape memory actuators, commonly called muscle wire. These wires are formed from a nickel-titanium alloy that changes structure and contracts when heated. It's easy enough to envision a flat valve that is open and closed in this manner. After humans, we moved on to fish with their gills and swim bladders. Insects use a valve called a spiracle that it turns out is not unlike the flap valve we'd already considered. Taking a turn, we considered adaptations to external flow in the form of wind or water currents. Termites and prairie dogs, for example, construct tunnels that are passively ventilated by pressure differences, though not necessarily with valves. Another change of direction got us thinking about containing air as opposed to regulating it. Diving bell spiders, for example, build an aquatic web to contain a bubble that they breathe and live in. From there, we spent a while thinking about natural containers such as eggs and seeds and the various conditions that cause them to allow or prohibit the transfer of air or water. But ultimately, the most exciting conversation was about plants and the amazing functionality of their stomata. It turns out that there are a lot of parallels between how a leaf breathes and how our battery needs to breathe. The battery takes in oxygen and in the process loses a bit of water from its electrolyte. If too much is lost, the battery will cease to function. The leaf takes in carbon dioxide and releases oxygen, but it also must be careful not to lose too much moisture, or the plant will wilt and die. It accomplishes this task by opening and closing pores only when it needs to. These pores are called stomata, and the way that they work is fantastic. The opening is formed in the space between two specialized cells called guard cells. These crescent-shaped cells open the stoma by changing shape when they swell with water. This shape change occurs because the interfacing wall of the cell is thicker, and therefore stretches less, and also because swelling is limited in other directions by support fibers in the cell wall. The swelling itself is driven by an osmotic gradient generated by pumping potassium and other solutes into the cell. This happens in response to sunlight and low carbon dioxide concentrations, and is then reversed when it's dark or too hot in order to prevent the loss of excess moisture. The stoma seemed like the perfect biological model, so I thanked Karen profusely for her help and dug into what seems to me to be the crux of biomimicry. I needed to abstract the design principle and cross the function bridge, and this took me a while. But ultimately, I decided that the fundamental function was the shape change, which was coming from the structural non-uniformity in the cell. I didn't need potassium pumps or cells for that matter. I just need a membrane with slits and anisotropic structural properties that can cause them to deform and open. With this idea in my head, I started thinking about what these openings could look like. An important property of the guard cell deformation is that it's bistable. Once the cell has swelled, no more energy is required to hold the stoma open. Now in engineering terms, we call this a latching valve, and it's critical to this application because we can't afford to constantly drain the battery just to hold the pores open. So I started thinking about membrane geometry that would have this bistable property. After a number of failed attempts, I arrived at a bent membrane with pairs of slits in it. When the web between the slits is pushed down, it inverts and holds itself in this new position. Then when it's time to close the valve, the web is inverted back. The valve can hold itself in either state as long as required with no additional energy. Given the scale, we'd need a number of these openings, which would correspond well to the pattern of ventilation holes in the top of the battery. The last thing that I needed was an elegant way to drive the webs up and down. If it was a uniform membrane, like a single sheet of rubber, then it would need to be actuated externally. But what I really wanted to find was a way to have the membrane actuate itself. I did some research and came across a material called Ionic Polymer Metal Composite, or IPMC. Unlike other types of electroactive polymers, IPMCs can be driven with only a few volts. In this video from the University of Sydney, a sheet of IPMC is shown self-deforming in response to an applied 1.5 volts, pretty close to the 1.3 to 1.4 that comes from a single zinc air cell. Combining these ideas together, it's easy enough to imagine a sheet of IPMC laminated with a stiffening material and an elastomer to form our biomimetic stoma valve. In the end, I'm really happy with how this exercise went. Running through the whole process helped me understand a lot about biomimicry that I didn't before. 
I'd hoped to illustrate that quality concepts could be generated this way, above and beyond the work that was being done at the time. However, I think that this resulting mechanism is better than most, if not all of the other concepts that I've seen. They all involved both a valve and an independent means of actuation. With the stoma valve, however, much like the biological model, the valve and the actuator are one in the same. It's extremely small, power efficient, and inexpensive. Had this concept existed at the time, it certainly would have made its way into the prototype and test phases, and from there, who knows?